Hello, my name is Pastor Freddy Reynosa, and I am the senior pastor at the Stoner Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church on Nobility Hill in Stoner, Massachusetts. Our church has been serving the greater Boston area for over a hundred years through ministry, education, and community service. You can find out more about us at our website, stonamemorial.org, or visiting us in person at 29 Maple Street. We thank you for joining us here at our weekly church service. We have some announcements today, and uh, uh, and I'm gonna call Andy. So she, I, I like that she's always ready. I think you could probably use that microphone or that one. No. 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 no? no. Oh. I didn't know it was such an emergency. <laughs> it's like there is something here. Yes. I kind of like that uh, the song that uh, Elizabeth was playing too. Maybe, maybe. Uh, Maybe we can sing, Andy, you and I. I so. Okay. <laughs> okay. But, but we have something that, uh, that is it's next Sabbath. Yes. Can you believe that it's next Sabbath? It's I'm really so. excited. Yeah, very much so. So uh, for you, those of you who have been here, we've been announcing a very special um, evangelistic tool that's going to be brought to our church next week, all day Sabbath. How many of you have heard of that evangelistic? Oh, just a few. Well, I'll start over. <laughs> yes. Next week, um, and I want to also thank uh, Pastor Freddie, because Freddie has a heart for evangelism and a heart for the Lord. So I just want to thank you, Freddie, for letting um, this event take place in our church. We've invited a woman named Barbara Taylor, who is an expert in small group evangelism and she'll be bringing to us the new beginnings dvd series which is meant for lay people to do this is not just meant for the pastor to do but for lay people to do so anybody can do it if you can read and you have a voice and you can speak you can do this why because you have everything provided for you and there'll be images and so what we're going to do next week is for Sabbath school time, church time, and Sabbath afternoon, we're going to be immersing ourselves in how to win souls for Jesus Christ using small groups. It's called the New Beginnings DVD um, series. And I hope that everyone joins us. There'll be room up here and room downstairs as well. We'll also be eating, but not as a potluck, but everybody will bring their own food and we will make sure that everybody's safe and social distances. So we will be having a great time, and I want to see every single person in this place here. And Freddie, will we be able to live stream that event? Yes. Excellent. Uh, I'm speaking for the AV team, but uh, they, they are so helpful, and uh, yeah. uh, even for last minute thing, but I'm sure that we'll be able to. Yes. And so we are going to be beginning at 9.30 in the morning. What time did I say? 9.30. 9.30. We want everybody to be on time. You're going to hear Barbara Taylor's testimony, which is amazing. And we're going to also be having audience participation. So you'll be actually demonstrating your skills at reading and speaking. All right? Yes. So that's what we're going to do, 9.30, and then for church, and then Sabbath afternoon. We'll be done around 4 o'clock. All right. Okay. Um, Thank you. I think we're we're excited about that event, right? Uh, Amen. Something else that I'm seeing right now. I think uh, maybe you want to tell us uh, who are some of your guests this yes, morning. Yes, these are my kindred spirits. My identical twin sister is sitting here with her husband Brian, and our absolutely wonderful close close friends Don and Denzel McNeilis are also here. They've been here. All week we've been fellowshipping together and doing some things in our neighborhood together and it's been one of the best weeks of my life. It's been amazing. Oh wow. So, well, welcome Lord. to our church. Thank you. And uh, um, let's see. What
Second reading from Giselle Bayingana. Bayin okay, you're going to help me pronounce that name. Um, the name of, of the FDA church is Walden? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm always confused. I mean, I'm sorry, but here in New England, you make some words difficult to pronounce. I didn't know it was, it was supposed to be reading, not reading. So I've been trying to get to reading, and nobody seems to know where reading is. But uh, I guess we're learning, right? That's the good thing, always learning. So um, is Giselle here? Not here, but uh, uh, since today is the second reading, so, um, how many of you want to welcome Giselle to our church? Saying, Amen. Amen. And if you're online, say, type, Welcome. Um, something else. Cause, um, I like to get people, you know, uh, reactions, just calling people without letting them know, or maybe letting them know like five minutes before. So, uh, Raul, maybe you can get me another microphone. Uh, this is a special day, but it's also kind of a day that we, we didn't want this day to come, you know, but, uh, but Elizabeth has been uh, with us for some time, and I thought it was good to give her an opportunity to... Uh, speak to us a little bit on, and share with us some of the, her experiences here in our church. And I just did that like a couple of minutes ago. That's, okay. Okay. I, I kind of short notice, right? Very. <laughs> Very much, yes. But, uh, uh, but we're, we wanted to thank you for all the time that you've been here with us. And I know that this time is, is coming to a close and uh, in the seven months that I've been here, uh, I have enjoyed getting to know you and, uh, uh, and just the, the spirit that you bring into this church is going to be missed. And uh, this is from um, last night that we had communion here. And uh, uh, my children, when they got home, they were arguing uh, because they were saying that you're their best friend. So everyone wanted to be your best friend of my children. So that's just a sample of how much it has impacted this church. Thank yeah, you. so how, how, how long have you been here? I think it's almost three and a half years now. Almost three and a half years. And it was the minute I walked in the front door that I knew I was home. I thought, you know what, I'm a visitor. I still need to check out the other churches in town, which I did. But I knew as soon as I walked in, I was coming back. And I have no regrets making this church my home. Thank you. And I think that uh, uh, all of us who have interacted with you have been blessed. Thank you. Uh, by your time here. You needed to stay at least one more year, you know, like Jesus with his disciples. He stayed three and a half years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but we're thankful for these two and a half years. Thank you. And we pray that... Uh, uh, that God will bless you, you know, as you travel back. When is your last day here? In a few short days. A few short days. Yeah, so I didn't want to miss this opportunity that uh, you could uh, say uh, whatever's in your heart to the church. I just want to say thank you to this church for making me feel welcome the minute I walked in the door. Within a few weeks of being here, some church members volunteered, well, actually, rephrase, the first Sabbath I was here, I was out letterboxing. Talk about encouraging visitors. Um, a few weeks later, um, someone volunteered me for part of the service, and as a church, you welcomed an effective, complete stranger in, and you not just welcomed me, you embraced me. Um, potlucks I lived for, because when you move countries, it's crazy how little food you have access to at first. Um, but also the fellowship along those lines. And I truly have the closest friends of my entire life here. 
I'd been at work six weeks and my boss goes, yeah, do you have any plans for the weekend? And I said to him, actually, I do. And he's like, how? W what are you doing? So he knew that I was a Christian. He knew I attended church. So I said, well, obviously, I've got church on Saturday and then I've got this and this Sabbath afternoon. I'm going hiking with friends on Sunday and then Sunday afternoon I'm doing this. Because you've been here six weeks. How have you got so many friends? I looked at him and said, church? <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, thank you so much for the opportunities you've provided me and for me, the, the children's stories have been so much fun. You've challenged me, you've helped me go further. Um, the music, I, I was almost scared to play the first time I was here. Everyone who plays an instrument here has a tertiary degree, if not a doctorate in music. So to let someone who's self-taught contribute is huge. Um, and all the other things that have just happened along the way, it's been a wonderful experience, something that I am never going to forget. And each and every one of you have been a part of that. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> one of the advantages of having, you know, things that we do online now is that even though she's going to move back to Australia, she still can be part of this church. And that, uh, Every time we need a children's story, we're going to send you a text because we love her children's stories, right? <laughs> yeah, so we're going to have to sing along too. I don't know how we're going to do that, but uh, thank you for uh, your ministry here. And uh, I want to pray in a special way for you as, uh, you know, God leads you back there. Father in heaven, Lord. We want to thank you for Elizabeth and for the time that she has been here with us. Father, we know that she has been a blessing to many of us. And, uh, and Father, we ask that as she goes back to Australia, Lord, that you will continue to lead in her life. We thank you, Lord, for her positive, positive influence in this church. And we pray, Lord, that we will see her again. Uh, Father, if not here in this world, physically, but we know that, um, that when Jesus comes, we will be able to meet again. So, Father, uh, keep her safe in her, as she goes back home, and, Father, that she will also be a blessing there. Uh, we send her, Lord, in your name with your blessing, not because we deserve it, Lord, but because we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to give you a little bit update on, on Freddy uh, that um, took in again this Wednesday to see the doctor. And uh, every time that I take him, he's doing better from his eye. And, uh, um, but it, it was interesting but that when I was there, the doctor called another doctor that is and showing, you know, this is Freddy, and, you know, he started explaining some of the things that he, he went through. And then the doctor told me, like, I want you to tell uh, your friends, your church member, thank you. Because she says, I'm sure that it was the prayers that work in his eye. So when I was thinking of that, you know, I was thinking, you know, the, the power of, of prayer and the power of coming together as, as God's children, you know, and the, the impact that can have, not just on us that receive the blessing, but on others who are witnessing uh, the things that God continues to do. So thank you very much for praying for him, and, uh, um, and let's continue to, uh, to pray and continue to uh, stay connected with each other during this time. I think that's all the announcements that we have. If I remember something, it'd probably be too late. But, uh, but yes, have, have a good Sabbath. morning happy sabbath now is the time for the children's of our church and the story i brought for today is about prophet elijah uh, he was in the times when king ahab was he in israel 
But King Ahab, he served Baal and worshiped Baal. So Elijah came with a message to tell that there was not going to be no rain no, and for the next years to come. So for the next three years, there was no rain and there was famine everywhere. The animals didn't have any grass, any plants to eat, and the, the products they harvest, they couldn't harvest anything because it was um, terrible those days with no water. So when the king Elijah, uh, when the king uh, Ahab saw that, he called Elijah and he talked to Elijah about it and he uh, named Elijah as a troublemaker. Elijah replied, it was not me who caused that, but it was you and your family that abandoned the Lord's commands and worship Baal. So he uh, told King Elijah to, to gather the people from all over Israel and they were gonna do something that they're gonna show who is the true God. So Elijah suggested that each of them uh, bring the Baal prophets and take a ball, cut it into pieces and lay it on, on the wood. So they would offer a sacrifice to Baal and he would do a sacrifice to God. And they will find out who was the true God. So they gather the, everybody, the people from all over Israel, and they met at Mount Carmel, and they could see the prophets worshiping, running around their, uh, their uh, Baal God. They would say, oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. They leaped about the altar which they had made, and nothing happened. It was at noon when Elijah started mocking at them and say, cry aloud, for he's a God. Either he is meditating, or maybe he's busy, or maybe he's in a journey, or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. But as all of us know, nothing would have happened because only we know there's only one God. So after they were done, it was Elijah's turn, and Elijah, brought the people of Israel closer to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. He put the wood in order, cut the bowl in pieces, and laid it on the wood and said, fill, our, fill four water pots with water and pour it in the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, uh, add water another second time, and they did it on a second time. They had water the third time, so the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. Do you think that Elijah knew that with water it's gonna be able to, to make fire? Have you ever tried doing a fire pit and put water on it? Would it turn on? Would the fire would it be able to turn on? No, right? But Elijah knew he was 100% that there's a God in heaven that is going to answer his prayers. So Elijah prayed, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that you are the Lord God and you have turned their hearts back to you again. When he was praying, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. Everything was consumed. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Dear boys and girls, who is your God? The way you treat your neighbors, the way you dress, the way you eat, the way you talk shows who is your God. May you choose the true God in heaven, the one who is going to come back again and take us all home. Amen.
Good morning, church. The scripture reading for today is found in Acts 17, 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them. Dionysius, the Arapagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Good morning, church. If possible, may we please kneel down, kneel down for prayer. Dear God, thank you for another day for another day that you gave us today. Thank you for another Sabbath that we have to worship and praise you. That we can leave all our stress aside from whatever it is throughout the week. I ask you to please bless the pastor and his message he will be giving. Please protect us from your mighty hand through this pandemic and all who have been affected by it. Please keep on protecting the church and blessing the members which have come today or are joining us virtually. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Good morning. I miss you guys a lot. All this time, we praise God at home. And we decided to praise God with our family. May God bless each one of us. And then pray for us.
Amen. It's all about that, right? Jesus says, if I am lifted up, I will draw all to me. It about, it's about Jesus' life, death, resurrection, about his work in the heavenly sanctuary, and about Jesus coming again. It's all about Jesus, right? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for this wonderful Sabbath. We thank you, Father, for the, for the privilege of opening your word. And Lord, we ask that you can speak to us, that we can learn some things that we can put into practice in our lives. And Father, also that we can learn how we can share the good news with others around us. So speak to us, Lord, because we want to hear your voice. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today, I was, um, before coming here, I was in the Sabbath school lesson. It was in the lesson, and I, and I, was, uh, I was teaching the lesson, and I was teaching it in what many consider to be the language of heaven, which is Spanish. That's what people think. Probably it's going to be English, so we don't know. When we get there, we'll know. But I think it is important for us to, um, to understand that sometimes we need to translate the message. It's not always into a different language. Sometimes we need to understand the context. We need to understand the culture so that, that we can reach people where they are and we can bring them to a knowledge of Jesus. As we, as we have been studying uh, the book of Acts, if we would uh, write and take note of all the things that the apostle Paul did, uh, he was a very successful church planter and evangelist. And I think we could learn a lot from him, what the methods that he used to reach people showing that the gospel is for you, for Gentiles, is for men, is for women, is for rich, it is for poor. And in chapter 17, he shows us that the gospel can reach also those intellectual people. The gospel is also for them. The reality is that the gospel is for everyone. Because the gospel is the good news of Jesus. And this good news is what we need, even when we are not aware of that. In fact, the Bible tells us that God has put something in our hearts. And, and, and because he has put eternity in our hearts, there is that fire of human beings that is always searching for something. And everyone tries to fill that void in different ways. And when it's not Jesus, the one who they're putting in their hearts, it doesn't matter the toys, it doesn't matter all the things that they accomplish, they are still going to feel and be empty. Because it is only, it's only Jesus. So we go to chapter 17 this morning. And we'll, we're going to look at three examples of how Paul shares the message in different audiences. Chapter 17, we start reading in verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ has to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. The audience, the synagogue, 
people who already have a knowledge of the Old Testament. They have accepted that there is God, there is a God who is in control of things. So they have that understanding. They study the scriptures and they wait for the fulfillment of the promised Messiah. Then Paul goes with them and he, for three Sabbaths, he is with them, talking to them and showing, proving from the scriptures. What is it that he's using? He's using the scriptures to show that Jesus Christ is the one that they have been waiting for, that he is the Messiah. And we have been studying, his, his method is always go to the synagogue first. Remember, he talks about the, the, that's what he follows always. Goes to the synagogue, there are people who already have a knowledge of God. They discover that through looking at the scripture that Jesus has already come, and now they can share that with others. A lot of times we think about doing the work without first coming together, praying together, and training. Sometimes we think, okay, we don't need to do any of that. And I believe that that's why I'm so excited about what's happening next week. Because we need to come together as a church. We need to pray for our community. We need to train. We need to, we need to see how people are doing things. And we can learn from them so that we can also share the good news of Jesus with others. So that's what Paul does. He goes to the synagogue, gets people you know, excited about the gospel. Then they go and share the good news with others in such a powerful way that in many examples that we have in the book of Acts, the whole city would come together and listen to the message of Jesus. So he's always following that. So in Thessalonica, he proves from the scriptures that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Then, as always, right, we talk about it before, that the gospel raises opposition. It's always important for us to understand that when we're working for Jesus, there's going to be opposition. It's part of when we're working for him, we can expect opposition. So it's always the same. Things have not changed much, right? There is opposition to the gospel, but then Paul does always the same thing. He preaches the gospel, then goes somewhere else. He goes somewhere else, and then after being in Thessalonica, probably he was there for about two months. And when he was there, one of his churches sent him a gift. He writes to the Philippians, thanking them for the gift that they sent him. That was probably the church that cared more for Paul than all the other churches. They always had him in, in their minds. So he goes, he goes from Thessalonica, and then he goes to Berea. And we go to verse 10, chapter 17 and verse 10. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Again, these, talking about the Bereans, were more fair-minded. Other versions are more novel than those in Thessalonica. In that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believe, and also not few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. Again, Paul goes to the synagogue. These people are more novel, the Bible says, so fair-minded, they were more open, okay? We're going to find all these people when we do ministry. We're going to find people that are open, like the Bereans are. That doesn't mean that they will accept everything that Paul is telling them. They are open, to what he has to share, but, but then they search the scriptures to see if what Paul is saying is true. You know, and you hear a lot about it. There are many churches that take that name, Bereans, because it's, it's a novel character, you know, of searching the scriptures and, and being open to what people have to say, but then going into your Bible and check if what people are saying is true. So that the Bereans, again, go to the scriptures, and they, they are open to what Paul has to say. They receive him. 
but then they check to see what he's telling is truth. I think that's something that we all should have, you know, not because we hear something, not because a pastor says something, but we should always check if what people are telling us comes from the Word of God. So that's what the Bereans had. Then the biggest challenge, because there is Athens, and Athens is not a good place for the gospel. If people were going to do an evangelistic experience in Athens, they would think twice. Because Athens is the place of philosophers, all this wisdom of the world. So, but the gospel is for everyone. And Paul is in Athens because we know that he's not thinking of staying there for a long time, but because he's following the guidance of the Holy Spirit, wherever he goes, he, he's preaching, right? So what is the, that he does? Well, he has time, and he starts observing things. So if you want to um, reach people, you need to observe people. You need to see um, how they live, you need to know their needs. You need to know their fears. You need to know all these things so that, that you can meet them where they are. Some of the things that I learned uh, in, uh, when I was doing Bible work is that, that, that you have to pay attention to every single detail. If you go to a house and, uh, uh, and you see that there are some toys, that means that this family has children. So you need to think about bringing something for their children. And you know, and, and it's always good to be observing things. I remember when I, when I was in California, there was, uh, I was doing Bible work. We were knocking on houses in Sacramento during summer, about 108 degrees. I don't know if, if you have ever done door-to-door <laughs> -door sales or knocking on houses, you know, offering Bible studies. But that's, during that type of weather, it's hard. And I, and I was doing that. I remember getting into a house and uh, knocking on the house, and there was a good man. He says, I'm not interested in what you have to say, but here is a bottle of water. So I, after about a week, and not having any success, we started, uh, we started praying with my partner and seeing how we're going to reach these people with the, with the message. So uh, what we decided to do was to leave the Bibles in the car, not to take the Bibles, but just started walking on the streets and just talking with people. So doing that, I started talking with, with a man and um, he had a daughter, and his daughter had a, a baby, about 12 months old. And they had uh, done a, a birthday. So I started talking with them. And uh, uh, you know, during those years, to do something in computer was, people really appreciated that. And I'm not gifted in computers by any means, but I told them, you know, I, I can do, I can put all these pictures together in a CD. And uh, uh, so they gave me the pictures, and I struggle a lot because I'm not <laughs> computer savvy, so, but, but I put the, uh, the pictures in a CD of, of their grandson, uh, as, as, you know, and, and, and the son, and, and I gave them that. They, they, that did something for that family, that they started to open up a little bit more. Uh, the man uh, told me that he had a court date, and I said, you know, I'm going to be praying that everything goes well. So he opened that a little bit more, and, uh, and then I took my Bible studies, and we started studying the Bible. And I realized that that, that was a very effective way of reaching people. Um, in that same year, uh, there was this man who chased me with a machete. I don't know if you ever experienced that, but I don't recommend that. Well, by then, I was probably like 50 pounds lighter, so I didn't stay to, 
see if he was really serious about using it on me. <laughs> but, but I realized that, uh, that people were not that open. Um, some of them are, if you knock on their doors and start offering Bible studies. But others will be more open if you start talking with them and listening to them. Because we were uh, working with uh, the Amazing Facts and Wimar back then, and we had the, the New Star program, uh, I figured out that if we, that a lot of the people had um, problems that it were about lifestyle issues, and you know, in that way we were able to, to offer something for their benefit, and then we would reach them with Bible studies. Because I, this is what I believe. I believe that God wants to save us. And, and, um, and, and this word, salvation, we struggle to understand this word. Because when we think of salvation, we think of, of just save from sin. But, uh, but some of the older versions of the Bible, um, when they talk about salvation, they talk in the context of health. So the God of our salvation um, includes that physical part that, that is important for us. So I, I saw that when we were talking with them about some of these things and helping them to, to eat better, and, and they would be open then to receive what we have to offer. So what I'm trying to say is that we need, as we are working for Jesus, and we're trying to share the gospel with others, we need to pay attention to people first. Uh, because... When people know that we care for them, they will be more open to hear what we have to say. So Paul is really open. Uh, he, he is he's talking and, 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 I'm, and he's listening and, and, and he knows that the people in Athens are not the same as the people in Thessalonica or the people in Berea. So he needs to change a little bit, not the message, but the way he presents the message. And we read and... Um, Chapter 17, verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentiles worshippers in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So even what Paul is using here, um, the text says that he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers. The word he uses here for reason um, is the word in the original language where we use dialogue. So he's not just proclaiming, he's not just preaching, but what he's doing in Athens is that he is in a dialogue with people. Why will he be doing that? Because the philosophers... Socrates and all of them, this is where Socrates was, I think that's how they taught the students. It was a dialogue. It was, it was a, a question expecting an answer from, from the students. So Paul is adjusting a little bit, not, not using the same method he used in Thessalonica and Berea, but now he's asking questions. So that gets the people excited because they see that, that this man has something that they want to hear. They have something. I mean, he has something they want to hear. And the Bible continues tell us, telling us. So they, they tell Paul, come, we want to hear you. Whatever you say, it sounds like, like we might be interested in listening to, to what you have to say. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. He's paying attention to the things that he's seeing. There is uh, something with the unknown God. Well, the, the, these people from Athens were so superstitious that some archaeologists have discovered some writings from those centuries, third and second century, with, um, with inscriptions to the unknown gods because they felt that if we don't know about it or we have forgotten about any of the gods, maybe the god will punish us. So we need to make all these statues so that we don't miss anyone. 
So Paul is saying, okay, I noticed that you're very religious. You see, he was concerned that for their spiritual life, but he doesn't start just calling people like, you know, you sinners, idol worshipers. No, no, no. He, he is saying something that, that they will listen to what he has to say. You're very religious. Therefore, he says, the one whom you worship, without knowing him, I proclaim to you. He makes the connection that unknown God is the one that I proclaim to you. So you have to understand what these people believed in order to understand his sermon that he's giving here. Well, the Epicureans, they were followers of Epicurus, and uh, um, they, they, be they believe in, um, in that they were different gods, but they view them as too far removed that they were not concerned about the things that were happening uh, to human beings. Uh, there is a historian who summarizes their view in saying, nothing to fear in God, nothing to feel, nothing to feel in death, good pleasure can be attained, evil pain can be endured. So God is so far removed, he's not concerned for the things that are happening here. Make me think of, uh, of William Miller. You see, it's the same philosophy, uh, deism. I don't know if I'm saying that word correctly, but that's what William Miller, before he, he started reading the Bible, uh, he even made fun of people who read the Bible because they did, he didn't believe that God was involved in the things that were happening in this world. So there are people who, who still think like that today, that God is, is not concerned about the things that are happening in this world. So these are the Epicureans, and they're the Stoics. They think, okay, God is everywhere. There's no way, God and nature are, are together. So yeah, it, it is, there's no difference between them. So Paul starts saying, you know, you're very religious, <laughs> not confrontational, <laughs> but then he talks about the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. Okay, some of them thought that their gods were there, that they needed a temple. Notice he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Remember that, that these people worshiped their gods and they would give things to their god to appease them, but says, no, God doesn't need that. He gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Okay, God is very involved, he's saying, in other words, and he has determined the pre-appointed times, okay? And, he and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might find him, that they may grow him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. You know, you believe that God is so removed, but no, he is there so close to us. He is not removed from us. For in him, he quotes some of their poets, we live and move and have our being. Interesting that he doesn't quote the whole thing, he just quotes that that agrees with him. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we are not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or a stone, something shaped by art in men's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the men who he has ordained. He has given assurance of all this to all by raising him from the dead. You see, he's bringing his message to conclusion now. He starts to where they are, but now he's presenting Jesus in a way that, uh, that he didn't do it in Thessalonica, he didn't do it in, um, in Berea. He's showing that, yes, God is different than nature, but, but he has control. He, he's involved in what happens in our lives. Even though he doesn't need of us, he has always there with us. And and even though they believe that, you know, there was nothing after this life, he's saying, yes, you know, there is the judgment, 
So it is important the way you live your life because there is a judgment because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the men whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, remember these are Greeks. This believe, this believe in, the, in the immoral soul. Some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Verse 33, so Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysius the Areopagite. This is one of the men of the council, of the philosophers. This man believed, and, and, and among them Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Some people think that, that this is a failure on Paul, but I don't think it is. I think this is, this is, this is a difficult group of people, but because he's working with the Holy Spirit, he's, he's reaching them where they are, and, 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 he, and he, um, he starts getting the message, not in the way that that he did it in other churches, but he knows this is a different audience. But the message is the same. The message is that there is judgment, that Jesus is the Messiah, but he didn't start that. He started with uh, things that they agreed on. Um, one of the best tools uh, for Bible workers and for anyone is a small book by Mark Finley, the one who wrote our quarterly. It's, it's the best friend of Bible workers. When we were doing Bible work, we would have that little book in our pockets. Because it's a small, it's called Studying Together. Yeah. And it talks about different denominations and what they believe. But it shows the things that we agreed with them. Because it is, it is confrontational when you start with someone with the things that you disagreed on. But if you start with the things that you believe, I think people are more open to receive those things that you disagree on. Um, that's very important. I remember one time, we were on an evangelistic series, and there was a, a Pentecostal man, and, uh, uh, and he approached me after the meetings, and he says, uh, Freddie, what's the difference between Pentecostal and Adventist? And I said, oh, there are many things that we agreed on. And I started talking about the things that we agreed with them. And I remember uh, a new church member was there, and he tried to help. And he said, oh, uh, I was also up in a castle, and, uh, um, and I just started the Sabbath, and it made a lot of sense to me. I don't understand why Pentecostal don't keep the Sabbath. And it's one of those moments when you want to use your elbows but you pray that God will give you patience, right? But, but it is important that we understand where people are coming from, that we care for them. That's what Paul is showing here. He cares for them. And then bring them into the whole message of God. So um, I believe that during these times, you know, there, there are a lot of people who might want to hear what we have to say. Because we have come into a point that that some people are at least open, but they don't believe in absolute truth, right? And, uh, um, and even though they don't believe in that, I believe that we can start planting seeds in what people believe and then bring them into the understanding of, of the whole gospel. So we, we can learn that from Paul. Why am I talking about this? Because I, I believe that it's important that us as a church, every one of us has neighbors, has friends, relatives, people that they know that, that you can start sharing about Jesus with them. And always start where people are. And then bring them into the truth. And I believe that God is calling each one of us to do that. Because I believe that Jesus is coming soon. And we need to organize ourselves as a church and we need to do this work that God has called each one of us to do so that we can finish this work and we can go home. I believe that in this world where there is no hope, 
God has given the Seventh-day Adventist Church a message that can give people hope. God has given us a message that can give us that assurance of eternal life, that freedom that we can have so that we can share that with others. I pray that uh, during this week, the training that we have, that we start praying for, for those people that we want to reach. Start praying with them and see ways that you can reach them. Think of some of the needs that they have and how you can help them with those needs. And think of ways that you can uh, become friends with people. You see, in order to reach people, they need to know that you care for them. And we need to, uh, as God's children, we, we need to learn from Jesus, who was a friend of everyone. So that's what we need to, to do. Because I believe that God is preparing a people to prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. And I hope that after this training this week, that we will start thinking, not just inside, but we'll start thinking outside how to reach our communities. And I pray that uh, 2021, we will have an evangelistic series where we can uh, bring people unto Jesus. So this week that we're going to start, how many of you want to be used by God? How many of you want to uh, pray that God will give you wisdom to reach the people around you? Amen. I want to pray that, that God will give you those divine appointments, that you will be able to share about Jesus with others during this week. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for Jesus because it is all about him. And thank you because Jesus has entrusted us this message to us that we can proclaim the good news about him. And Father, this is what the world needs. This is what the world needed in Athens. And this is what the world needs in Massachusetts in 2020. So Father, we ask that you can, Lord, empower us with your Holy Spirit. That we be able to share this good news with others, Lord. And that, that very soon, Lord, you will give us that joy of seeing, Lord, those around us coming into the knowledge of the truth. And Father, we also pray that, that you will keep us faithful to you, that we will stay close to you always, Lord. Father, help us to, to connect with each other during these times and help us, Lord, to encourage each other. Be with our church, Father, in a special way. And Lord, we ask that you can bless uh, this training that we're going to have next week. Lord, that we will all be here and that, Father, that that we will be inspired and motivated, Lord, to, to share the good news of Jesus with others. Be with us, Lord, during this Sabbath, because we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, this is Pastor Christy Hodson. Thank you for watching our program today. We hope to see you soon in person or live on YouTube for our Saturday morning worship service. You can also find information about online Bible study groups at our website, stonemmemorialchurch.org. We currently have a food bank and clothing distribution center located at 9 Gary Street and operate Greater Boston Academy, an elementary and preschool at 108 Pond Street. If you have any questions, please call us at 781-438-2977. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.